Today's video is sponsored by PCBWay. More on that later. What's up everybody? I'm Charlie with Modern Hobbyists, and today I'm gonna to be sharing the top five things I wish I knew before I started messing around with LED strips. And it starts right now. Welcome back everybody to another episode of Modern Hobbyist. And if you haven't already, make sure to smash that like button and subscribe to my channel so you don't miss any of my awesome projects or terrible jokes. Today we're talking about LEDs. Now, LEDs have tons of everyday uses. For example, I just installed some LED recessed lights in my living room, but today we're talking about LED strips. Now, unless you've been living under a rock, you've heard about LED strips and you may have even found a use for them already. They can be the perfect addition to a dark gaming den, a great way to brighten up underneath their kitchen cupboards, for even a way for self-obsessed idiots to display how many subscribers their YouTube channel has. What? Whatever your reasons are for picking up an LED strip, I'm going to share the top five things I wish I knew before I started using them myself. Tip number one is to always make sure to diffuse your LED strips. If you wanna avoid your lights looking cheap or casting really ugly choppy shadows, you have to diffuse them. Diffusing your lights helps to hide the individual pixels on the strip, and it's gonna have the biggest impact on the overall appearance. It can be as simple as covering the strips with paper, plastic, acrylic, fabric, or if you're feeling adventurous, you could even 3D print custom diffusers to fit your needs. Sometimes even just bouncing the lights off a surface can work great, so long as you leave enough distance between the light strip and the surface you're bouncing the lights off of. On that note, you'll need to leave some space between the lights and the diffusion material, otherwise you'll still be able to see the individual pixels anyways. Now, if you're not interested in figuring out how to diffuse the LEDs on your own, you can always buy aluminum mounting channels on Amazon, which come with plastic strips to act as the diffuser. These mounting strips are awesome, and they actually do a great job of keeping your light strips cool by dispersing the heat through the aluminum channel. We'll call that tip 1.5, but you need to make sure to keep your LED strips cool. LED strips will almost never get hot enough to burn you, and the chances of them catching fire from heat alone are minuscule, but excess heat will shorten the life of your LEDs. So, long story short, adding an effective heat sink to your LEDs will make them last longer. Tip number two. You don't always need addressable LEDs. Individually addressable LEDs are basically smart in the sense that you can program the color for each individual pixel on the strip. Each pixel has a tiny chip that reads an input from a microcontroller like an Arduino, a Raspberry Pi, or even a special LED controller and sets the color and brightness of each pixel individually. Non-addressable LED strips can still have their colors changed and they will need a microcontroller of some sort as well, but every pixel on the strip will be the same color and brightness. Now, a lot of applications won't require individual control of each pixel, and you can save a good bit of money by simply going with a dumb LED strip. It can be confusing to tell the difference, especially because oftentimes Amazon will show the strip with multiple different colors, when in reality the strip can only be set to one color at a time. A good way to tell if you have an addressable strip or not is by looking at the solder pads and labels on the strip itself. An addressable strip will have a voltage input, a data input, or DIN, and a ground pin, while non-addressable LED strips will often have a separate pin for red, green, and blue values. But some strips may vary, so another good way to tell is to take a close look at one of the LEDs on the strip. And if you see a tiny black square inside the LED, it's either a smudge of dirt or more likely a tiny microchip, in which case you're looking at an addressable LED strip. Now on the same track as addressable LEDs, you don't always need RGB LED strips either. If you only want a single color and you don't ever need to change it, then just pick out a single color strip. The first benefit here is that you can skip the microcontroller altogether. Single color strips only have two inputs for voltage and ground, so you won't need anything to tell the LEDs what color to turn to. You'll still need a power supply, which we'll talk about more later, but skipping out on RGB can simplify the install and setup tremendously. RGB lights are also notorious for being bad at producing a nice natural white light. Now I'm colorblind, so I don't really notice anyways, but if color accuracy is important to you, say for photography or filming YouTube videos, then either go with a solid white LED strip or make sure to get an RGBW strip, which adds a dedicated white LED for better white light. Tip number three, don't be afraid to cut your LED strips. One of the reasons people love LED strips is because they can cover a huge distance. 
They sometimes come in 15 foot rolls and assuming you power them correctly, they can cover a huge amount of real estate for a small price. But sometimes you only need three feet or three pixels like I used in my subscriber counter. And since you can't always buy a specific length, it can be much easier and cheaper to just buy a long strip and cut it down to the size you need. The only thing to keep in mind here is that depending on the LED strip, you can't always cut between every pixel. So make sure to find the spots on the strip marked with either a scissors icon or dashed lines with some solder pads. Cutting your LED strip is also a useful option if you have to make a sharp turn, as looping the strip can result in uneven lighting, which in my opinion looks bad. Now, I would recommend that you get a soldering iron and learn how to use it because that is a skill that you can benefit from in other projects. But if you aren't interested in soldering, you can get these solderless connectors for LEDs that come in all kinds of angles and usually work great. Also keep in mind that not all LED strips can be cut and that you may permanently ruin your strip by attempting to cut it. So always make sure to read the product description and search for cutting indicators on the strip before you grab your scissors. Now, if you're interested in electronics projects beyond just LEDs, then make sure to check out today's video sponsor, PCBWay. PCBWay is a company that specializes in prototyping and small volume production, making it the perfect one-stop shop for all your do-it-yourself project needs. Using their online tool, you can upload a gerber file, select your design settings, and get 10 custom PCBs for only $5. Now, even if you don't have a need for a custom circuit board, PCBWay might still be able to help you out as they also provide 3D printing, CNC machining, sheet metal fabrication, and injection molding services. Make sure to check them out at the link in the description below so you can take your electronics projects to the next level. Huge thanks to PCBWay for sponsoring this video. Now let's get back to it. Tip number four, waterproofing. Now I personally haven't installed any outdoor LED strips since I didn't own a home until recently, but if, for instance, you want to put LED strips outside on your patio, you'll need to make sure you pay attention to the waterproofing ratings before you buy them. Each LED strip comes with an IP rating, which stands for Ingress Protection Rating, and it's basically a measurement of the amount of protection the LEDs have against solid objects and liquids. The IP rating comes with two numbers, the first of which stands for protection level against solid objects, such as dust, debris, or even something as big as my finger, while the second number stands for the protection level against liquids. The solid protection level ranges from zero to six, with zero being no protection at all, and six being complete protection against dust and other particulates. And the liquid level goes from zero to eight, eight meaning it can be permanently submerged in water. That's a ton of numbers and letters to remember, but the most common and most important ones for LEDs would be IP20, IP65, and IP68. IP20 is basically the bare LED strip, and it would be fine for use indoors in a dry environment. IP65 is covered in a thin layer of silicone, which means it's protected against all dust and small particulates, and it can withstand jets of water from any angle. IP68 is fully protected and can be used underwater, and I don't even know what you would use that for, but it would probably be a pretty cool project. So if you happen to have an underwater LED project, make sure to let me know in the comments below because I would love to check that out. And last but certainly not least, we have tip number five, and that's to make sure that you pick the right power supply. If you've made it this far, then I'm assuming you've picked out an LED strip that will fit your needs. You've got a means of diffusing that light, and all that's left is to figure out the best way to power it, and for that, you'll need a power supply. When you're picking out a power supply, there are really only two things that you need to pay attention to the voltage and the amps. The voltage is easy enough to figure out as most LED strips say right on the flexible circuit board, and most of the time they're either five volts or 12 volts. The amps aren't quite as simple to decipher, but thanks to Watt's law, there is a simple equation to figure out what power supply you need. Watt's law states that power, or watts, is equal to voltage times the current. So if we rearrange that function, we can calculate the amps by simply dividing the watts by the voltage. Now, if you check the product description for the LED strip you bought, it will likely state how many watts your strip uses. This measurement is basically the worst case scenario, meaning the entire strip is set to full brightness, and if you have an RGB strip, all three pixels, red, green, and blue, are on. Some product specifications only list a watts per meter, so if that's the case for you, you'll need to make sure to multiply that value times the total length of your LED strip to get total watts before dividing by the voltage. So for example, if we have a 12 volt LED strip that consumes 24 watts 
at full brightness, then we'll need at least a two amp power supply. Now that two amp value is the bare minimum. So it's usually a good idea to add some buffer when selecting a power supply, because generally speaking, the more amps, the better. So for this strip, I might go shopping for a 12 volt, three amp power supply. So that way I know my power supply can handle the current draw from the LEDs. If you don't know the wattage of your LED strip, a good way to estimate the amps it might pull is to assume each color of each pixel pulls around 20 milliamps. To be clear, that's 20 milliamps per color, so an RGB pixel would draw 60 milliamps at full white. But if you have a single color LED strips, it would just be 20 milliamps per pixel. Then all you have to do is count or estimate how many individual pixels you have, and you've got a fairly good guess at how many amps you need. Now, sort of continuing on the topic of powering your LED strips, before you buy an LED strip, you'll want to ensure you've picked one with the appropriate pixel density for your needs. The more pixels you have per meter, the more power it will take to light up your strip. Most LED strips you'll see on Amazon come with either 30 or 60 LEDs per meter, but they can get as high as 144 pixels per meter or more. So you'll need to make sure to take that into account when selecting a power supply for your project. In the end, LED strips can be a great way to get started on your journey into the rabbit hole of do-it-yourself electronics, and they can be an amazing tool to really transform your projects as long as you're doing it safely. Anyways, that's it for this one. I hope you found some of these tips useful, and if you did, make sure to hit that subscribe button and give this video a like. If I got anything wrong here, or if you have any other useful tips that you'd like people to know, make sure to share it with me down in the comments below. Also, I'll have links to some of the LED products that I've used in my own projects down in the description below, so make sure to check that out if you're interested in using them yourself. Otherwise, that's it for this video. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you guys in the next one.